This is Learning Works, a podcast presented by Hone. It's a series of in-depth conversations with L&D experts, HR leaders, and executives on how they've built game-changing learning and development strategies, unleashed business growth through talent development, and scaled their global L&D teams. Tune in for the wisdom and actionable insights, the best in the industry. I'm Tom Griffiths, CEO of Hone. Welcome to Learning Works. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by multi-time learning leader, executive, board member, and author, Jenny Dearborn. You'll hear how Jenny crunched big data sets to identify key skills gaps, created impactful learning interventions with measurable business outcomes, and aligned the learning strategy with the corporate strategy to drive sales and leadership success at big organizations like HP, Success Factors, and SAP. We also discuss how to tell a compelling story that resonates with your executive team and showcases the impact of learning on business outcomes. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Works podcast. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my friend and our advisor at home, Jenny Dearborn. Jenny is an author, an executive, an advisor, and a board member, and has really seen it all when it comes to talent development, both at the small scale with startups and at huge global scale with big multinationals like SAP. She's a five-time chief learning officer, chief talent officer, and chief people officer, including some companies you may have heard of like HP, Success Factors, and SAP, where she was CLO in charge of internal training for over 70,000 people globally. She's written two books, The Data-Driven Leader, A Powerful Approach to Delivering Measurable Business Impact Through People Analytics, and Data Driven, How Performance Analytics Delivers Extraordinary Sales Results. So we're going to dig into some exciting things around measurement. Uh, we've known each other for a few years, and she's been a tremendous help to me and Hone as we've built our company in this space. I can't wait to dig into some real meaty topics and some amazing experience with Jenny. Jenny, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. So Jenny, one of the things that we originally hit it off around was the subject of using data in talent development. And you've obviously written a couple of books on that subject. So I know it's close to your heart. I was just curious to hear, how did that come to be? What, you, what got you originally so interested in the uses and importance of data in talent development? Yeah, I know exactly the sort of turning point or the pivotal moment that, that turned me from a regular learning leader into a data obsessed learning leader. So I was at Hewlett Packard and I was responsible for global sales enablement. And I remember very distinctly presenting at a QBR and putting up a slide that was hard to gather all the data for this QBR. And it was, it said something like, 2,000 sales reps took this one-day class and gave it a 4.5 out of 5 stars, and 1,500 sales reps took this two-day class, and they gave it a 4.7 out of 5 stars, and I thought that, that was the end of, of my job because I was presenting the volume, and I was presenting the transactions, and so I was also feeling really good because it was hard to gather that information. And the CEO at the time stopped me mid-presentation, Mark Hurd, and he said, stop right there, because all I know for sure from what you're presenting is that you've wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. I don't actually have any evidence that anything that you do matters and makes our sales reps more productive. So why don't you go away and come back when you can actually prove that something that you do matters? And I oh yeah, good idea. So I slunk away and was like, how do I actually do that? How do I prove that what I do matters? I, because he was just saying that nothing I did had any value. I started to try to gather the data that he was asking for, like CRM data and all this stuff. And I couldn't because it, I was above my pay grade and it was not something for me to be, I wasn't allowed to see the data. So then I was pretty sure that I couldn't at that company deliver the results that the CEO was asking for. So I started up myself on a path to move to a smaller company where I would have access to the data and sort of to be a, a bigger 
fish in a smaller pond. And so then I went to Success Factors, which was about 1,500 employees and was responsible for sales enablement there. And so the, and then started a path to run sales enablement at Success Factors, but also with the understanding that I would have access to all of the performance data. And so the first book, Data Driven, which is published in 2015, is the story with the names changed of my journey, my first year at Success Factors. And I would, the book came about because I would go to conferences and present at small conferences. A lot of people would just stand up and say, this is what I'm working on. And here's my progress. And there would be lots of us sharing. And so I would share, I'm like, here's my progress. And people would be like, how did you do that? I'm like, I, we just, made it up and we just figured it out. And then I got invited to bigger and bigger conferences. And then I was presenting the work that I was doing at on a bigger stage. And I would just get thronged afterwards. And people were asking me, where did you learn how to do that? And it was my team and I just figured it out. Really, it was my team. And then conference attendees would say, can you please write it down? And so I, yeah, so that's what became book one is my journey that I went through my first year at Success Factors. And then we just fictionalized that. And that became Data Driven, which is a book about how to use learning and performance improvement tools to predict the performance of sales reps. And then the second book is the same algorithms, because we use some some fancy math, the same algorithms to predict the effectiveness of leaders in leadership roles. Because I was, it was a dare and somebody said, okay, you can do this with sales because there's so much data in sales. Of course you can do After a while, it was like, obviously you can do this in sales, but can you do it in leadership like a dare? And I was like, I (laughs) totally can. So then the second book, The Data-Driven Leader, yeah was that's how that story was born and that was the that's the story again a fictionalized version of what we went through at SAP that's phenomenal and there's so much in that <laughs> i love it there's so many common challenges we hear all the time i can't get access to the data or i don't know how yeah. to prove what i'm doing and then yeah it's easy in things like sales that have got dollar numbers on them but what about fuzzier things like leadership and management yep you've done it all and so this podcast is now <laughs> going to be five and a half hours long as we dig into it all but yeah i guess it would be interesting to just dig a little deeper and understand perhaps a little more about the methodology starting with the sales side of how you went about going beyond just those level one ratings that got shot down a little by the CEO and got to things that really did prove the business case or prove to the executive leadership that this was working. Yeah. I give a lot of credit to Sanchita Sir, who is was my partner in this. She's the math brain of it. And she's the CEO of a company called Mplay, who I partnered with. And what we did was really start with looking at the CRM and we pulled out the different stages at the time. I think we had five stages, sales sales cycle stages. Every company has something different and how they configure their CRM. But we would look at CRM data and we would look at where do deals fall out of the sales cycle? First of all, we had to tell everybody that we were doing this and be sure to put your deals in the CRM and put them (laughs) in accurately because day garbage in, garbage out. So you needed a sales team that had really good discipline in how to use the CRM. So then we would pull CRM data of like, where were deals stalling? Where would they, where would deals fall out of the sales cycle? And then we found the, just again, just studying the CRM data, found the sales reps who were the best at each stage, just because somebody is great at closing, maybe they're great at that last stage. So we found the sales reps that were best at each stage, did a lot of interviews of sales reps to and a lot of shadowing like silent on the call double jack this is before like gong so we were like double jacking on calls and and really like a like an archaeologist like what exactly are they doing and how much do they prep and so we really understood 
what was the knowledge, skills, behavior, competencies, habits at every stage of the sales cycle. And then we could say, okay, at this stage, stage one, you need these 10 skills. At this stage, you need these 10 skills. And then we would say, okay, then how do we assess for those skills? Because the skills are going to be different at every stage of the sales cycle. So how do we assess for those skills? And then how do we teach those skills? And then how, so we basically took a problem, broke it apart, analyzed all of the pieces, putting a thousand piece puzzle on the ground, studied everything, and then slowly put it back together and really understood that coming together. And, and then we could really, really finally calibrate. And what we found were 167 variables, so puzzle pieces, when we broke the whole thing apart that were distinctive. Some of them were the same across stages. And then we developed training and learning or performance support tools or some other support mechanism like a coach or something like that for every single stage. And then we just kept running the process and we just kept running it until it was faster, faster. And then we could just shorten the sales cycle. And then what we did is we got to the point where we, I think we had the 5X increase in new hire sales reps meeting quota. Yeah. It, we just started hitting our stride and sales reps were just crushing it. And then it became this, this learning mechanism became part of the pitch to recruit new sales reps, right? Mm -hmm. We'd say, come to success factors. Don't go to work day. Our competitor, our little itty bitty competitor that had just started on the other side of the bay <laughs> or some other competitor come to us because we can basically guarantee, not literally, but basically guarantee that you'll make quota because from a sale, from sales reps comp structure, like they have to make, they have to make quota or they're gone, right? Their base is actually pretty low. And so, you know, anything that a company can do to help that sales rep make quota, and they're not just like on your own with a laptop in their home office, then the sales reps, okay, I want to go there because I know I'll be successful there. But it became mm -hmm. part of this whole pitch for the company. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. There's some fascinating stuff in there. I think you know, just at the high level, looking at all of those benefits, not just driving sales results, but engaging employees in their own development and even going so far as to attract talent more effectively because of this certainty that you could have around their performance and the development that they would get. It's amazing. I think it was really interesting to hear where you started as well, because when we think about how do we use data in learning and development, oftentimes that's as you first described, which is after the program, oh, what can we go look at to see if it had an impact? But actually you started with the data to understand where was the drop off in the sales process. Let's break that apart into the skills. Then let's assess on those skills. And only at that point do we start doing any interventions or training. And of course, there's the output metrics beyond that. But it's really awesome to see that you've done that kind of upfront data analysis as well. Yeah. And, and to the point where I would say to my teams, if you don't know what you're going to measure before teaching a class or a skill or a, anything, don't do it. If you can't know, this is red on our dashboard and we're going to put this learning intervention in place. And then we're going to measure that this goes to yellow to green. If you don't have that structure set up up front, don't waste people's time, especially sales. A lot of people have time is money and they don't have time to waste, but sales especially are on the clock and, and you can't every, for every sales day that you waste, that they're, that they're at, you're asking them to do a training class and they're not out in the field selling that affects the bottom line of your company. And then now everybody's jobs are at risk because you've just wasted somebody's time. If you don't know and have fantastic certainty that you're going to call up a sales rep and ask them to stop selling to prospects because you want that sales rep to do your learning thing instead, you better damn know that thing's going to work before you waste somebody's time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And ideally, when you've got the results, you can show here's the lift in performance, therefore more than pays for itself as the time off the floor. Um, but how did you actually get that then? Was it a phased rollout? Did you try it with some smaller group of reps first yeah. just to get the data and then have the confidence to roll it out further? Yeah, for sure. So always start with a pilot. And, and then measure the heck out of it. So a ton of measurement up front. So you know exactly what you're expecting and, and then st start with a small group of people who are willing and you want it to be an even sample. So it's just mm. like top performers looking to get incrementally yep. better because then that's going to skew, that's going to skew all your data. So you want it to be an even sample of performance levels, but a small group and something and you want a pilot short enough that's really not more than a quarter, a quarter of inter intervention and then a quarter of results. Sometimes when we do pilots, we're like, I don't know if it's going to work and I don't know how long to wait mm -hmm. until I get the results. It, you have to have that, that research design up front before starting because you, you, again, you just don't want to waste people's time. You want to yeah. go slow up front to go fast later. Yeah, no, 100%. And like you say, you're doing a science experiment, you're picking a control yeah. group and yep. a test group and uh, proving a hypothesis that this works. That's great. So I know it was a dare yeah. to move this over to leadership, given <gasps> that's where our hearts are. I would love to hear how that translated and what were some of the differences or the challenges of doing that and how you overcame them. Yeah. So it the harder part for leadership was what really is success? What are the success measures? And so we were pulling a lot from the employee engagement survey, but we would just, we would look at specific questions because also you don't want to, you don't want to teach to the test, right? For leadership. You do with sales because a sale is a sale, but with leadership, there's a lot of things that go into, I'm telling people bad news, even though it's, the, I have to say it, now they're mad. The, the hypothesis going in is that even in difficult times, uh, a good leader, or a great leader can still have good employee engagement survey right. results, even in bad times, even during a layoff, even in the darkest times of a company, that's the time when a leader can step up and still really perform their their leadership to their leadership strengths. And then you just need to go into the survey and pull out specific questions. So don't certainly taking anything at the aggregate or at the average of things can be dangerous. So you mm -hmm. want to go into very specific things. So we would pull out specific questions like trust and we would really study how things are how things were phrased. Do I trust my leader to tell me the truth? And not did I like what I heard, but did I feel like my my leader was acting in the best interest of the in a balanced way, in the best interest of the balanced the corporation, the employees, the customers, and the shareholders, things mm -hmm. like that. And we made sure that we didn't factor in any questions. Am I happy with what my leader had to tell me. Not that we were in bad times at SAP because we, we weren't, but we were just really careful in what were the measures of leadership. And then you start, and then I'm telling the story backwards because we had to start with what are the leadership principles of SAP? What does it mean to be a leader here? What are the values, leadership values? Because leadership is measured differently in, in different places. And so our definition at, of leadership at SAP was being a talent magnet and growing and developing talent underneath you because we had a strong culture of promote from within, very informed by SAP being a German company that, you know, so internal talent development and leadership development was super important. It's not the kind of company where you're just going to keep pulling people from the top and people at the bottom don't move. There's this expectation that people are moving up the levels all the time. And so we had to go in and, and analyze how many high performers did you have? Did your high performers move? Did you promote them to other functional areas? We put in talent rotation programs. Did you, so there was a question like, did you encourage your top talent to leave your team and go someplace else? And were you creating high performing 
people to come up underneath. So we had to yeah, do a lot of maneuvering in our, in our talent management yeah. systems to be able to pull the data. And we would this, no offense to success factors, which is the tool we use, but it, success factors couldn't do this. So this was, we had to build a separate data lake and pull reports and then manipulate the data in a separate system that was custom built for the purpose of doing the research. And then the research became the book. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I think it's really interesting to look at the, the differences there, right? So in the sales case, we're looking at pipeline data to see through sales stages where the issues are, diving into understand competencies and training on those. In the leadership case, it's coming more from the values of the company, the principles that are important, and then mapping those somewhat fuzzy principles to real hard data in the employee system of record to see if folks are progressing or rotating. That's really neat. And then you know, I'm sure you're able to create some leadership development interventions, training yeah. around that and see the impact. So yeah, we'd love to hear the end of the story in terms of how yeah. it actually played out. Yeah. So similar to the sales example, we would, we could, we broke apart the competencies and skills and behaviors and characteristics and habits of the best leaders. So what is, from a data perspective, our best leaders were the ones that were moving, ta were talent magnets and were creating a talent pipeline of developing people. So continuing to meet their business performance metrics, had high um, engagement scores, and, and then you went within that and you could break down like tr trust and other behaviors and characteristics. And then also moved talent through. So we like really a talent pipeline and could had an efficient way of growing, mentoring, coaching, developing, and then exporting talent to higher roles. And so we found the leaders that were the best at that. And again, shadowed and double jacked on their calls and analyzed and just researched the heck, heck out of these best example leaders. And then be, and then made sure that we stripped out bias and things like that because we were such a cross cultural I and mean, we were in like 180 countries or something and then used that those formulas and those models to inform a new development of our leadership curriculum so then we the leadership program that we put in place was for every, there were five leadership levels for the 10,000 or so people managers. I think there were 6,000 at the level one, at the first level manager. And then it just went up from there. And it was a, uh, a three day face to face program to prep you for the level. So for high performing individual contributors that want to be ready to be a people manager, they went through that program and then they were put in a pool and then first level managers were interviewed from and pulled from the pool of the graduates that went through the leadership readiness program. And then they were put in the first level manager program, manager role, and then they were put through a three-day program there. And then after three or so years, they were, they could elect to go through another learning program that was a readiness for a manager of managers program. They went through the readiness program and then they were promoted into the next level and then they went through that program. So what we found was super successful was not get the job, learn about the job, but it mm -hmm. was learn about the job you're trying to get the job and then take another learning program that says, okay, now you're in the job. Mm -hmm. And because what we found was most, so what flamed leaders out was, I think I want that job and then I go get that job. And then I'm in the job and then I'm like, oh, I don't want this job. <laughs> so what do I do to get myself ready? Just similar to sales, before you pick up the phone and you have a prospect, you do a lot of role play, mm -hmm. doing a lot of practice. You are training. You don't go out and try and run a marathon without training. You know, it's all of the readiness things that you can do before you start prospecting, before you start managing people. How do you prepare? And those are the most successful leaders have a, spent a lot of time in preparation. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot of this was done at scale, which is great. And we'll talk about that yeah. in a little bit. 
But with 70,000 employees, it sounds like 6,000 to 10,000 managers slash leaders at various levels. There's good sample sizes there to be able to do a lot of this data analysis, which is great. Just curious for some of the folks listening who've got uh, much smaller employee populations than that, say a few hundred to the low thousands, they might have a hundred, a couple of hundred managers. What advice would you give them, if anything, that's different about doing something at a slightly different scale? Yeah, I I think it's easier at scale, mm -hmm. but the steps are going to be the same at a smaller size where you want to don't just jump in with a solution. Oh, I heard about this training program on the radio on my drive in. So I'm going to go implement it. Whoa. What are you trying to do? What are the outcomes you want to achieve? How do you know it's broken? What would it look like if it was fixed? Whatever it is. How are you going to measure your success? Because whatever it is, regardless of the money that you're spending on the learning, it's people's time. And that is the most precious thing and just the most heart crushing if you waste people's time. And also you're burning your reputation, like you're burning the bridge of, because then the next time you say, hey guys, I have another training program and that I want you to try, they're going to be like, oh, here's the learning link, always <laughs> chasing the next hottest distraction and using us as guinea pigs. We're the employees and she doesn't know what she's doing. She's just signing us up for stuff and telling mm -hmm. us I have to do it and sending us all these nasty emails, reminders. The more time you spend up front understanding the problem, taking the problem apart, understanding the knowledge, skills, behaviors, competencies, habits, whatever, that feed to success and, and challenges, and then be able to really train towards those specific skills and behaviors, and then put that problem back together into a learning solution. You know, that those are the same things, whether it's 10,000 people managers or a hundred people managers, yeah. always start with a pilot, be able to prove the impact and the value of your pilot. And then you have credibility. You can go back to leadership of your department or your company and say, here are the results that we have from this pilot of mixed randoms. And mm -hmm. here's their fantastic success. And I'm very confident I'm going to get that same success level when I go out from this group of randoms to the larger population. Yeah. It's such good advice because it's the right thing to do, right? Follow that logical process. But to your point, when you get in front of executives, the story writes itself if you've done the process right. And you look extremely exactly. credible ahead of, I would say, 90% of learning leaders. If you've really got that problem solution mindset, here's some preliminary evidence and data to show that this is why we should scale it. So that, that's such great advice. On the th same kind of theme, just curious if you see common mistakes or challenges that learn learning leaders make when they are working with data. Yeah, I think over uh, overreacting to level one data, mm -hmm. and I st and uh, God, I feel so old sometimes. Like I cannot believe that we are still so focused as an industry on four out of five stars, and mm -hmm. it's just it's crazy. So I remember a project at success factors when we were, we, it was sales training. It was new hire sales rep orientation and beautiful 11th floor of our San Francisco high rise looking out at the bay and sales reps would fly in from all over the world. And it was like 50 sales reps a week. And everybody from all over the world came for this one day, excuse me, one week thing. It was a case study and it was guest speakers and it was projects and presentations and homework and all this stuff. And we, it was great. And then sales reps went off. And then we started hiring at a volume that I had, at, or it's, I can't remember, but anyway, it was like one week it was in the, on the 11th floor in this beautiful conference room. And then one week in the basement, which was like cavernous and freezing and no windows <laughs> and all that stuff. And then the next week in the, on the 11th floor, and then the next week in the basement. And then there was enough <laughs> of these examples that my team came to me and said, oh, we have to stop teaching in the basement because the <laughs> level one evaluation scores were so bad. <laughs> and we, and I said, what do you guys suggest? So they said, we suggest slowing down hiring. And so that we can only have the volume of people. I said, you seriously want to slow down hiring <laughs> sales reps. And 
so we had enough data. We had 200 sales reps or something that had gone through on the 11th floor and 200 that had gone through in the basement. And I said, well, all right, let's look in the data. So then we went and we put these two groups together and we looked at discount rate, call rate, closure rate, how many bill of material, how many other products are they putting in the bill of material? How long is the sales cycle? Like all of the pieces of the CRM pulled everything out. And guess what? It was exactly the same, exactly the same. Oh, so then I was we, hoping you were going to say the basement group was better and it was going no, to be, you should was, do your training in the was, basement. You couldn't tell them apart. So then we said, okay, the 200 people, then we sent them a separate survey and said, gosh, you're crushing it in your sales numbers, just like everybody else. What Give us feedback about your experience that was specific to the basement. And it was cold. <laughs> it was cold. That's why yeah. they were so mad. So yeah, it's <laughs> level one evaluation. And then we did this bigger research project and we found that really what drives those level one evaluations is was the instructor fun? Was mm -hmm. the catering good? And was the temperature of the room comfortable? <laughs> That's what drives level one evaluation scores. That's it. Yep. Like at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't care if you're cold. Bring a parka. Put a note in the email <laughs> that says, bring a parka. Sit in a parka. That, it, you know, you just got, you got to be really careful. Like what is mm -hmm. actually driving way, way back in the day at Hewlett Packard, people, the evaluation scores were fantastic through the roof because that was a day that they didn't have to be on the phones. It was, right. they got a break from the call center and they loved it. They don't care. You train me on anything you want. I don't care. I'm not going to make a damn bit of difference in how I do my job. I am just so glad that I am not in the bullpen on the phones because <laughs> it was seen as a vacation day. Yep. So w what are you really trying to accomplish? Yeah. Yeah. And it can be a fallacy to over-focus on those or report them as positive. If they do come back, you've got to go to those higher levels, level two and learning, level three on behavior change, level four on ROI to prove to the business that it's working and just be good at your job to know that the things you're spending your days on are actually worthwhile. So I love that anecdote. I guess finally for this segment, talking of ROI at the higher level, 2023 is an interesting year for businesses everywhere. What would you say it's important to keep in mind as a data-driven learning leader in 2023? Yeah, I would say this is anticlimactic. I'd say stick with the basics, yeah. like really understand your, your pitch to your executive team. You want to put in an intervention you're trying to address this particular problem or metric mm. and you want to put this learning intervention or performance support tool or something in place. The cost of this intervention is X. The cost of the problem is this other number and the, you know, and the cost of fixing it. If that, if we could shorten the sales cycle by a week, if we could add two more other products into every deal or whatever it is you're trying to solve, be able to quantify that. And then you should have kind of an easy story. Like, mm -hmm. here's the cost of this problem. Here is the cost of the solution. And if you can't articulate it that way, I would say go back and do more homework. Yeah. But most really in, in tough economic times, no stakeholder wants to hear about this is what this will make employees happy. This will increase engagement. This will, unless you can directly tie a learning intervention to probably attrition and that this is going to be an attrition prevention thing. Mm -hmm. But remember, people don't really in their heart of hearts, people come to work for purpose and meaning and for making a difference. And a deeper level of joy comes from a job well done and workplace satisfaction. And I would be really cautious about never to cha chase like happiness. We want people to be happy at work. People, happy is fleeting. It comes and goes. It is, I just think it's super dangerous to, to try and chase that because it's almost like a drug. Like you're just going to have to keep amping it up to continue to delight and stimulate people. So it's better to go as a learning leader. It's better to tr drive learning interventions that 
go towards purpose and meaning and some deeper levels of joy at work. And that really comes from helping people to become higher performers. So I would really stick to the basics around identify a problem, the cost of the problem, cost of the solution or cost of the intervention, and then present it that way. Said, yeah, and that would be so clear for the executive team and the CFO who's increasingly involved in all of these decisions. If we can map it back to dollars, I think one of the things that you really espouse so well is on a related topic of connecting the learning strategy to the higher context of the corporate strategy. And that also allows you to tell a story of how this links to business outcomes and get the attention of the executive team. So what are the steps involved in that alignment process between corporate strategy and learning strategy? Yeah. And that those steps are really what motivated me from going from a learning leader, which I love over and over to now, hold on, learning is a piece of talent. So then I would be a talent leader. And then now hold on, talent is a part of the whole people strategy. So then I went from chief talent officer to chief people officer. But really it all came from how do I make learning more impactful? So starting with a corporate the bigger picture corporation strategy and what is the purpose of the corporation in the world? And then what is the strategy for that corporation to achieve that purpose? And then how do you know, how does that corporation, this is all work that the learning leader doesn't do. This is all mm -hmm. work that corp, your C-suite, your board and your CEO are doing, or your head of corporate strategy. Why does the company exist in the world? The purpose of the company. And then the strategy to achieve that purpose, and then the goals and objectives, measurable metrics to achieve that strategy. And then from those business metrics, you say, then that's the job of the chief people officer. What is the p overall people goal that needs to happen, that needs to be in place to achieve those corporate goals? Mm -hmm. And then you do your people strategy, like at SAP, it was to be talent magnet and to grow and develop talent from within and to be, I think, was the, maybe the tagline was like your best first job or something, really grow people. And, and so your people strategy and then your talent strategy from that and the talent strategy includes like compensation. What are we going to pay at the 50th percentile for our peers or the 70th percentile or whatever? And what is that bigger talent strategy? And then within talent is learning. And learning is one of the biggest places of pieces of talent. It's certainly the largest budget. And the in most companies, it's the largest budget and it's the largest number of humans within your HR team, except for recruiting. But <clears throat> typically, it's a large number of humans. But in order to achieve the learning strategy, you have to see how it fits within mm -hmm. those bigger things. And Honestly, it's challenging as a learning leader. If you come in to a company and you're like super data driven and organized and you're like, okay, and everybody upstream from you is a mess, it gets really hard to do your job. Uh, I used to tell people come to me and say, here's all these challenges. I'm like, you need to be in a different company because if they're if people at the top don't have a clear strategy, but they just feel like they're barking directions in one direction and, and they kind of giving things that feel contradictory and you're flip-flopping about what market you're going to be in and all sorts of, it feels messy at the top. And then you don't have a clear people strategy. What's our strategy? I don't know. Hire people and then fire them when they're no good. <laughs> Wait, hold on. That's not a strategy. And then what kind of learning do we need? Just let's not get sued. You know, it's just like <laughs> compliance, like what's legally required and let's try not to get sued. You're like, okay, this doesn't feel like a, this doesn't, th th then you, after a while you were like, maybe I should be someplace else because <laughs> everybody above upstream from me is reactive and doesn't have their piece together because it's really hard to do mm -hmm. your piece when you're, wh because you're at the end of the process, mm -hmm. right? Learning is the knowledge, skills, and abilities you need to achieve goals and goals aligned to a strategy. And if those other things aren't in place, you're like, how do I know what I should be doing? Yeah. So in some ways you find yourself in the role of asking questions that some of which may have answers, others don't, and maybe having to go find different pieces of the answer or make some assumptions just to fill in the blanks because 
it perhaps isn't a fully baked or at least stable strategy. And so you can you get by if you're staying at that company to just find the commonalities between the different directions. And yeah, how do you manage that, I guess, uncertainty or vagueness if it's possible? Yeah, I would go to your stakeholder and whoever mm -hmm. is you're signing off, you, whoever you report to, and lay it out and say, these are the assumptions I'm working towards. Yeah. I'd like to be able to address this particular business goal. <clears throat> if that's not clear, you don't want to insult people, but you just say, this is what I know I can control because I know that a really good employee onboarding by industry standard data a really strong onboarding program is going to reduce attrition at the six month mark. You can get that externally, right? You don't need to have an organized internal team to, to know that. And you can know as a learning practitioner, you know, what are the programs you can put in place and the metrics that they will impact. You can, what programs impact attrition and retention and engagement. You can operate without clarity above you in a lot of areas, just by doing good research in the industry and getting industry metrics from Association of Talent Development or the Institute of Corporate Productivity or Beerson or whatever. There's lots of things that you can do to back up your programs. Yep. Yeah, agreed. And like you say, looking at benchmarks and how you stack up. But again, on the theme of if you follow the right process, you're going to be able to tell a very powerful story and build your credibility. If you are upfront, like you said, about the assumptions that we're making here, the questions you would like answers to, but weren't able to get, and I understand that we're moving fast, but here are the assumptions I'm making. Therefore, here are the programs we're initiating. Then if something changes over the course of that program, then you can track back to those assumptions and explain why you're in this situation as opposed to being expected to predict the future and have a learning program in place for when things change. So I think that's great advice. So much wisdom in all of that. Jenny, just got a few rapid fire questions to finish up here. The first one's around stop, start, continue. So just given where we're at as an industry, we'd love to think, we'd love to hear from you what you think learning leaders should first of all, stop doing right now? Oh my God, stop doing. I think they, I think that we get distracted with, oh goodness, the fads. Fads. And what is the latest fad? Mm -hmm. And I think that can, I think that can be a huge distraction yep. for the, for learners and and for budgets and organizations and yeah a lot of money spent on what's the coolest newest jazzy distraction 100 percent. it's a great one because i think naively sometimes people can think that makes them look good and that they're current and they're going with the latest thing but actually it's the opposite and what really makes you credible is following that logical process of problem and solution and result so i think that's a great call out what are folks not doing that they should start doing? Spending more time really understanding your needs of your of your learners and the needs of your clients. Um, what I hear consistently is the learning team is uh, hiding behind the scenes and is worried about getting called out and is shy and just doesn't want to be out in front because they're afraid of making a mistake or somebody calling their bluff that they don't know what they're doing. And so they don't spend enough time really getting to know their clients and their clients' needs. And they should do that. Yeah, agreed. And then to give some credit out in the world, what are you seeing folks doing that you think is a good thing and they should definitely continue doing that right now? Yeah, I think that you guys are doing a great job with your ROI calculator and driving that with clients. And I talk about you guys a lot when I'm out in the world talking with, with clients and saying, even if they're doing something different, it has nothing to do with learning. I was doing some consulting about sales process and a sales tool. And I said, why aren't you guys using an ROI calculator? This other company that's a learning company, they use an ROI calculator. And and I just think that it's super helpful to be leading leading your customers 
to think about things differently, to be able to make your customers smarter so that they can be better advocates for themselves internally with their stakeholders. Right on. Yeah, no, thank you. That's been a real winner for us. What we're trying to do is, is just take a lot of this great wisdom that's out in the world and make it easy in a productized way for folks to deploy that and get a clear sense of ROI against the skills and capabilities that they want to develop. Appreciate the reference there. Last one, and we've talked about this a bunch, so I think we've probably already given people a dozen tips here, but what would one takeaway for a learning leader who's aspiring to progress in their career and they want to stand out to their team and their executive leadership team? What's one thing that they could do? A super easy thing would be to take a class on how to present data in a visual way mm. and visual storytelling of data and information. There's a couple of books written about it. I think there's a couple online classes. You guys might even have a class. I don't know. But I, when I was actively in the role, I put everybody in my team through that program and it found they were incredibly powerful at communicating to their internal stakeholders what they were trying to say if they could do it in a visual way. Such a great one because it's how executives think as well. Um, my previous company, FanDuel, the executive team, I think half of them were at McKinsey and they were just excellent at that and also responded really well to well-presented data as do all executives. So I think that's such a great tip and it's yeah. especially applicable to, to learning and development as we've been talking about. Yeah. Jenny, thank you so much for your time. This was a phenomenal conversation with so much wisdom shared. I always learn something when we speak. So thank you so much for being with us today. It was absolutely a blast. Thanks, Tom. It was really fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Learning Works. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, we encourage you to subscribe to the podcast for our exciting lineup of future episodes. Learning Works is presented by Hone. Hone helps busy L&D leaders easily scale power skills training through tech-powered, live cohort learning experiences that drive real ROI and lasting behavior change. If you want even more resources, you can head to our website, honehq.com, that's H-O-N-E-H-Q.com, for upcoming workshops, articles, and to learn more about Hone.